All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, today's topic is testing writing. Before we start, let's answer this question. Yeah. Mm. What kind of operations and functions do we measure in writing? Uh, one example is given. For example, expressing yourself and writing a complaint letter. Yeah, so. Mm. Grammar, we're talking about The aspects you know, describing here at Arujan, yeah. Describing is one of the operations that we use, yeah. Describing a picture, describing an event, for example, or narration, yeah. Okay, let's continue. These are the operations and functions that we measure. So, expressing yourself. Uh, like the opinion essay, for example, yeah, it might be summary and response when you read an article, summarize it, and then you respond to it, yeah? and where you express your own opinion. Actually, we have this kind of writing in uh, journals, different kinds of journals. When readers read an article and then they uh, write to the journal expressing their opinion, if they agree or disagree with one. We have it quite common. Uh, directing, when we give instructions, for example. Uh, describing, yeah, what we should mention. Narration, sequence of events, and reporting. Uh, so these are the uh, operations and functions that we use uh, in writing and that we measure. Text, what kind of text can we use? Yeah, there are many. Uh, as far as the type is concerned, it might be a letter, a form that we fill in, a message. Uh, well, we don't use faxes nowadays a lot. Yeah. Yeah. People use WhatsApp, yeah. Or we use email nowadays. Just scan and send the, the documents. Postcard, recipe, whatever. Yeah. Topics. Uh, topic and length actually depends on the mm, test specification. If you're appropriating your students for IELTS exam, well, then all the regulations mm, should comply with IELTS uh, requirements. Yeah? Types of writing. Well, there are two types of writing, controlled writing yeah, and guided writing that we can use mm, and activities. What's the difference between controlled and guided writing? Do you know any difference? Have you ever heard? No. Uh, these two pictures actually can illustrate what guided writing and controlled writing are. Uh, well, controlled writing is the outcome is totally predicted, so you're controlled. Yeah, you cannot uh, change a lot of things in your writing. Yeah? The outcome is almost one hundred percent is predictable, and uh, almost everybody will have the same answer you know, in controlled writing. So they're mostly like mm, practicing writing. When you practice, uh, when you mm, mimic writing, uh, when you develop your Accuracy, yeah, and then fluency in writing. Yeah? While guided writing is uh, more uh, is 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 less controlled. Let's say so. Yeah. Again, teacher actually guides students. Uh, she might help them to write, but it is less controlled, anyways. And the answer might be different. Actually, yeah, it's not one hundred percent predictable. All right. Here's a, a few facts about controlled writing. 
the outcome is totally predictable. Uh, nevertheless, the advantage of this is that it's highly reliable because the outcome is predictable. You know, it's either right or either wrong. That's why it's uh, uh, um, highly reliable. Even uh, one uh, score can actually evaluate and get a very high reliability in the scoring. It's easy and quick to correct, even by students, because there is, again, only one correct answer. Yeah. Uh, however, it lacks original expression. Yeah, there is a lack of it. It uh, might be time consuming and boring a bit for students. Yeah. It includes a lot of paraphrasing, for example. And if it, is, if it gets boring, teachers can actually assign it as homework. Yeah. Uh, even native speakers actually practice uh, this kind of activities with controlled writing. Sentence combining, for example, they combine two or three sentences into one. Uh, types of activities that you can use. First is jigsaw sentences, the simplest one, and students match sentence halves. Yeah, so there are two columns, A and B, and students must match. Uh, the other activities that we can use is what? Copying with corrections. So students are given a passage with a lot of mistakes, yeah? or not too many. Let's say one mistake in one sentence, for example. Uh, you can even use a funny sentence. Yeah? Uh, and students must uh, rewrite it by correcting. So it doesn't have to be only grammatical mistakes, it might be uh, content mistakes. Um, the content mistakes, for example, like flight attendants uh, fly a plane, for example, I don't know. Yeah. And blah, blah, blah. Actually, they're not, yeah, they do not. They, uh, pilots do. Now we can use dictation, yeah, old school dictation, when teacher dictates, pauses, yeah, after each sentence, the students write. Uh, however, there are a lot of different variations nowadays. Um, dictation, uh, you can use them as well. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know any variations of dictation, guys? Have you ever heard? No? There was a variation of dictation. Skip, skip your mind as well, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, again, uh, you can do it again in, in this way. Uh, the teacher tells the students to write dictation in the opposite uh, form. Uh, so it might be any kind of uh, opposite. It might be opposite negative sentence, or it might be contextually opposite. For example, once upon a time, they lived a queen. The student writes, once upon a time, they lived a king, not queen, yeah. or a princess or prince. Uh, she lived in a huge castle, for example. He lived in a tiny uh, bungalow, for example, yeah. and so on. So uh, it's quite funny, quite interesting. And then uh, the students can actually compare with each other yeah, what they wrote. Uh, so this is just one variation of dictation to make it more interesting and fun. Uh, another activity that we can use is Dictacomp. Dictacomp is like uh, audio Ronia in Russian. I'm pretty sure at least some of you did at uh, school. When the teacher, what's the difference between dictation? Well, the difference is that the teacher reads the whole passage uh, from the beginning till the end without stopping at a natural speed. Uh, she usually reads it twice. Students are allowed to take very short notes, only phrases. They're not allowed to write the full sentence. Yeah? And you won't be able to write the full sentence anyways, because uh, the teacher doesn't begin any pauses. Uh, after reading it twice, sometimes three times, teachers will read it like twice. Yeah? Uh, students have to reproduce the passage by using those notes 
so very short ones that they made, and uh, by their memory. Yeah. A very nice technique, actually, which develops not only writing, but also listening skills uh, and remembering, yeah, memorizing. Another technique is dictogloss. It's actually, it combines several skills. Yeah. It combines um, listening, reading, and writing skills. Uh, it's a very nice technique as well. You can even use it in online teaching. It's quite popular. Uh, what's the difference between dictocomp? Uh, the teacher breaks uh, the passage or a story into three parts. So the teacher reads the first part. Students again. Take very short notes. Uh, then the teacher stops. Uh, and he reads it only once. Uh, and then the teacher tells students to work in pairs. It might be small groups, like groups of three, and uh, reproduce what he said uh, by using their notes, right? And then writing together. And it's continued until the end. So the teacher again reads the second passage, the second part of the passage. Again, students work in pairs, they reproduce. And then the third work in pairs, reproduce. Uh, after finishing, the teacher asks the whole class to reproduce the whole story. Yeah, so quite interesting and funny. Again, you can use uh, funny uh, texts to make it more amusing. Interesting. Okay. Uh, but details is more used like activity, yeah? Because the students usually work and then they write, so uh, it's better to use it as an activity or develop more of fluency and accuracy. Rather than uh, testing. Okay, another task is transformation tasks. Yeah, sentence combining, sentence paraphrasing, sentence writing. For example, change the tenses in the paragraph. For example, from present to past. Uh, change full forms to reduced forms, contractions. So students do not write do not; they write don't. Yeah, uh, must not must be paraphrased to mustn't. For example isn't and so on uh, reducing the passage itself so students delete unnecessary words and make it smaller combining two you start, you should start with two sentences yeah and then maybe three sentences even native speakers do it uh, in their uh, english classes uh, they try to construct complex sentences and then change for example uh, the form from active to passive or Vice versa, change questions into statements and so on. Or like in the dictation, which I mentioned, the yeah, students uh, must uh, rewrite uh, the center passage using the opposite, like the, the form, like not the, the context itself. Yeah. Okay, let's continue with the guided writing. Guided writing is less controlled, as I mentioned before. And uh, teachers usually use pictures and the words to guide students. But uh, the result might be different, quite different, actually. Uh, the result is not always the same. It might be a picture description, just one picture. It might be a sequence of pictures, and students try to write an essay. An action, third, fourth. Students try to write out uh, what happened in this picture. Uh, writing a summary, it's another way of yeah, writing. A uh, keyword essay, which gives three or five words, maybe, writes them on the board. Yeah. Replying to letters. Yeah. So if you agree, disagree, again, summary and response. Yeah. Uh, or uh, it might be not just an article, but a real letter. Like, hi, John. Yeah. Like, pen friends. Yeah. I'm from Spain and blah, blah, blah. My name is Shakira or whatever. Replying. Mm -hmm. Writing advertisements. Newspaper headlines is a very nice technique when teacher gives only the headline. Uh, and students must reproduce the news for that headline, the very nice And uh, story completion. I used 
the school and uh, the class is really nice. Uh, the teacher can give um, the first sentence of the story or vice versa, the last sentence as a variation. And students must imagine what happens in the beginning of the story or vice versa by the end of the story. Yeah, we can start uh, an essay like, uh, it was a very nice, uh, warm day yeah a very nice uh, warm day and nothing going wrong until and that's it until and students continue yeah or vice versa you give the ending and i woke up in fear at that moment i understood that it was just only a dream for example yeah so you give the uh, ending and you'll uh, obtain very different stories, very different ones. So this is why it's guided. So the, it's not totally predictable. Yeah? The outcome is not totally predictable. You might have uh, a lot of different correct answers. Okay, as far as uh, technique is concerned, you should always use uh, direct testing because um, even uh, in writing tests yeah? so productive skills for writing and speaking they should always be tested directly uh, set as many separate tasks as possible well mm, this is why we have actually uh, two writing parts in IELTS yeah? we write an academic essay and then we for example describe a graph or a chart uh, a chart. So this way, uh, writers, evaluators, they try to obtain higher reliability. You know? So, so a greater reliability and validity are achieved in this case. Uh, but we should always balance practicality yeah, and reliability. If it is, if you have little time, uh, it's a progress test. Well. You can't have writing part and speaking part uh, the same day. Maybe you should divide it into two parts. But if you cannot divide it into two parts, well, then again, you must think, shall I include like two parts of writing or only one because of uh, limitation, time limitations, right? You can have your students like five hours in a row. It's quite impractical. So maybe you should give only one essay, not like two writing tasks. Or even three, yeah, which is, uh, I think, not doable, not practical. Next, uh, test only writing ability and nothing else, yeah. Don't test uh, creativity, imagination, intelligence, and especially general knowledge, yeah. In IELTS, again, they do not test it, uh, in neither in speaking part nor in writing part. Uh, they don't evaluate how creative you are. They don't evaluate how clever you are. Yeah. They evaluate uh, how well you write, how logically structured your sentences are, and the quality of your writing, uh, the content, the quality of your content. Content is very important, and how that content is uh, logically structured. Yeah, logically structured. How sentences are logically combined between each other. Yeah, how passages are logically combined so they're seamless. You you read it and you don't notice how. Uh, the writer actually passes from one point to another. Yeah? So this is evaluated actually in writing. When choosing a topic, be very careful. Uh, once I used a topic, actually it was from IELTS, I just uh, selected uh, a topic that seemed to be interesting for me. It was about uh, alternative types of energy and uh, going, shifting away from uh, a nuclear power. Uh, surprisingly, one girl, one student, she actually uh, couldn't write anything about it. She said, I don't know anything about alternative energy and especially about uh, 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 shifting from uh, nuclear plants. Uh, I don't know anything about them. And she couldn't write anything. So maybe we should, when selecting a topic, yeah, be careful, make sure that uh, those topics can be 
reproduce, produced uh, in L1 in native language. If students cannot produce it in native language, they won't be able to produce it in a non-native language either. Which topics are in L1. Here we have uh, poor samples of writing. Now, let's say why they're poor. So there are four uh, writing parts, writing is tasks. Uh, why are they poor? The first and second, for example, the first and second example, why are they bad examples of writing tasks? Any ideas? Well, because the task is more about uh, speaking, not writing, yeah, write a conversation you have with a friend. Now, so I can write a speech and describe you can yeah, again, speech. Uh, these tasks are good for speaking, yeah, not for writing. That's why I avoid using them. Third one, envy is the scene which most harms the senior. It's a problem. Sometimes students must, might not understand the problem. Well, they just might not understand it. Uh, so avoid using uh, proverbs, especially uh, culturally uh, laden proverbs. And again, what to a wealthy family? A wealthy family. Well, uh, if student is not from a wealthy family, yeah, he might not be. He might not know uh, the advantages and disadvantages <laughs> uh, of being born into a wealthy family. Or vice versa, it might be as the student might not be from a wealthy family and he might feel uh, not very happy about this kind of tasks. Yeah. So try to avoid culturally related tasks, try to avoid um, tasks um, which can somehow hurt your students, maybe. Yeah. This is why uh, having your holiday, uh, like a task which uh, Required our student, our teachers required from us uh, every uh, September. Like write an essay about your holidays. Yeah. Well, uh, not every student uh, actually might have holidays nowadays, because uh, maybe their family is not rich. Well, some family, some students might write that we went to um, safari on safari, we went to Egypt, and blah blah blah. So uh, this kind of task appropriate. So use something else. Use use different tasks which uh, doesn't show the difference between students in terms of their background and uh, social background, yeah. All right. Uh, restrict candidates uh, give no choice of tasks, give only one task, they give only uh, give the same task, give the same topic. Uh, that should be well defined. Provide information in the form of notes or pictures if necessary. It's uh, describing a graph, of course, there should be a graph, yeah? Uh, if you want your students to write a um, story, yeah, make sure that your pictures are clear enough and good quality. Use multiple scoring, because it's a productive skill. Yeah? Use at least two scores, at least. If you have three or four, even better. But we usually have two, because we need or we want for practicality reasons, yeah? We might have uh, only two scores. Usually we have two, sometimes three. Now, according to Harris, uh, reliability coefficient of a paper is put only once, only by one teacher, is uh, 0.25, which is very low. Yeah. However, if it is only one task and if it is evaluated only by one score, yeah, it's the reliability coefficient is 0.25. While um, if uh, yeah, while two tasks yeah, multiple tasks, uh, which were scored twice by two different people, now mm, obtained a reliability coefficient of 0.90, yeah, 0.9, which is very high. So it's always a good idea to use several scores, not only one. This way, in IELTS, they have several scores, not only one. 
and then Olympiads, different kind of Olympiads. Then sample tasks, yeah. A narrative there, which I mentioned, a story. We have, we have pictures, since it's mostly the story. Another task, describing a graph. A letter. Yeah, we have to write a letter to the accommodation officer of the college. An essay. And you should always write how many words students should write. 50, for example, or between 50 and 300. Now let's discuss uh, uh, scoring, uh, rubrics. Uh, there are two types of rubrics, holistic and analytic. Yeah. Uh, in holistic uh, rubrics, what do they have? They have only one score, only one score you know, is assigned. They have those uh, divisions, those uh, detailed aspects, Yeah, let's say so. For example, like content, fluency, uh, uh, coherence, content, coherence, and cohesion, for example, uh, vocabulary range, medical range. So we don't have them. So we have only one uh, general uh, description. Yeah. And uh, this is why it's uh, quite easy to score. And teachers, many teachers use holistic, yeah, use holistic scoring because it's easier. If you have a lot of students to check. Uh, however, students uh, might not like it. They might prefer analytic scoring, which is more detailed, which is more detailed. Because uh, a separate score is assigned for each aspect. Yeah? For content, a certain grade is given. For uh, coherence and cohesion, another grade is given. For mechanics, accuracy, another score is given, and so on. And then you just add up and get the average. Yeah, um, it's more reliable, of course, because several scores are given. Yeah, it's more detailed. However, it's uh, time consuming. This is why teachers actually don't always use it. But at schools nowadays, uh, yeah, teachers must use this analytic scoring. Um, this is why they don't like it because uh, it's time consuming. Uh, Another advantage, uh, candidates, students, are compelled to consider all aspects of the evaluation. So, um, content. Uh -huh. So, they know what uh, is going to be evaluated and they have to focus on it's like content is important. Okay. Uh, it was a human sequence is important. All right. I'll focus on that. Yeah. And so on. Uh, here is an example. And let's tell. If it is holistic rubrics or analytic rubrics, what do you think? Is it holistic or analytic? Yeah, guys. It is. Is it holistic? Yes, it is holistic, exactly. Because mm, there are no different aspects, only one description is given there. Yeah? So level two is this one, weak. Level three is this one, needs work. Level four is this one, good work, yeah, and so on. And uh, now I'd like to show. Oops. Analytic rubrics, for example, IELTS task, yeah. We have different aspects like task achievement, cohesion and cohesion, so logical structure is assessed. Uh, lexical resource, how rich lexus of a student is, grammatical range and accuracy. So they are evaluated here together in IELTS. You can actually divide it if you wish, and you can assign a different percentage. To each aspect, for example, task achievement or content, 30%. Uh, cohesion, 
might be again 30 percent something like that so 30 30 60. Uh, lexical resource and we want to call it accuracy might be like 20 20. As content actually comes first always we always must pay attention more on content rather than uh, accuracy but it doesn't mean of course that accuracy is not important at all it is important but content is more important let's continue here's the, just another example of uh, rubrics that you can use so first content organization or again logical structure yeah uh, cohesion, cohesion, organization. Content is task completion, yeah, going to uh, IELTS. Vocabulary, it might be the range, the size, yeah, how rich, how difficult. Language use is uh, in IELTS, it's uh, grammatical uh, range, yeah. So complex instructions, complex sentences. Mechanics. See? And task completion it might be uh, evaluated separately if you wish. Or you can just remove it because you have content over it. Yeah? It depends on, on your policy, yeah? on how you actually see the evaluation. Okay, uh, variations on traditional assessments. Yeah? Let's have a look. So you can use. Instead, uh, you, you can use a green pen instead of a red one in order to motivate your students. Yeah, because sometimes students might be uh, deactivated yeah, when they see a lot of corrections in their paper. Uh, you can discuss the marking criteria with your students before evaluating. Okay, let's discuss and agree uh, what we're going to evaluate in the writing. Uh, you just write correct answers in the margin. Actually, we do it a lot. Teachers do it. They write correct answers in the margins. Uh, we can use correction codes. Mm. Oh, here, here those both. Can you switch off your microphone, please? We can use uh, correction codes in the margin. Uh, we can also underline uh, all errors of one type only. So we can evaluate only one uh, mistake. For example, uh, punctuation. You can tell your students that I will pay attention to punctuation only, or I will correct only tenses, or I will correct only articles, and nothing more. Yeah. This way, actually, you can diminish uh, the number of mistakes of your students. You can lower uh, the number of mistakes of your students. Okay. You can mm, write a letter in reply. There, again, a nice technique. Yeah. Or you can just not write anything and then discuss it with uh, students, individually or in groups, or as a whole class. Uh, write a comment about the meaning. So only so here you just comment about the quality of your work. Yeah, you don't pay attention to. Mechanics, pay attention to maybe vocabulary range, but you're more focused on the message. And if the student actually can read that message well. Uh, another technique might be uh, devising, uh, constructing a quiz, exercise, or a game yeah, using those students' errors. And then you can even give a dictation based on sentences from students' work. Okay, let's continue with correction codes. You can use correction code like this, and teachers actually do not correct uh, the essay by themselves, but they use codes so that students uh, correct their mistakes. Yeah? For example, W might mean uh, wrong word. Uh, WT, wrong time, or wrong tense. Yeah. As our plane flew over the mountains, we see snow. See, we saw snow actually. So, uh, wrong tense. Wrong form. 
is wrong, for example, words, SP, spelling, flu, for example, here, F L you know. punctuation, P, X, extra words, M, missing words, R, register, question mark, but not clear, I don't understand what you're meaning. Uh -huh. And Exclamation mark, okay, it's still a mistake. I don't understand what you mean. And try rewriting. So you can use this correction code so that your students uh, correct uh, their mistakes by themselves. Uh, this is an activity. Let's decipher, let's find a mistake. When I was a child, only my father was very very strict m missing words what is it yeah m is missing words when i was a child yeah uh ww wrong oh early I was excited. Yeah. Yeah. Let's. Uh, I left with my friends. Ah, uh, I left or went out with my friends. I left with my friends, but had to come home early. All right. Uh, as you notice, sometimes it might be difficult to figure out your own mistake. Yeah. Uh, I've read and which says that uh, actually this technique writing correction codes and submitting uh, the same essay to your students back for more correction uh, doesn't really work because if students actually knew it <laughs> would have done it already but they don't know how to do it this is why it's quite difficult and this uh, kind of technique doesn't work uh, however yeah teachers insist that we should use uh, correction codes. Uh, the methodologists, educators, they insist that we should use them, this technique, uh, so that our students actually learn how to self. Uh, or they can work in pairs with their and uh, correct uh, their work um, together. In this case, maybe they might see their mistakes. Uh, all right. Uh, this is your homework. You'll have to work in groups of three or four. Uh, first, you have to calibrate scales, uh, which we mentioned before in previous lectures. What does it mean? You have to find uh, different essays, uh, which represents that uh, certain score. It might be an A essay, uh, a B essay, or a C essay. Yeah. And then you agree that this essay is actually A. Huh? This essay is B, and this essay is C. Then you should uh, retrieve one of the essays of yours from the same group. It might be your freshman essay. Okay. Then you correct that essay using the correction code, like this one. Yeah. And you should do it, of course, individually. I and mean, you shouldn't uh, show your um, how you work to your peers. You should do it individually. Uh, then you should evaluate the essay using the analytic scoring. scoring. And then you should submit uh, your evaluation to the team leader. And team leader will have to calculate the average um, and compare. Yeah. After that, actually, you will uh, present the results in our seminar. And, uh, uh, 
you will report. Yeah, you will report uh, how different your evaluation was or how similar your evaluation was. Yeah, like a kind of uh, short mini report. All right, I think this is it.